Hi, I'm Scott Al Miller, and this is my life living in Latin America. Now, as someone who has been living abroad for the last 10 years and takes being an expat very seriously, obviously I have a YouTube channel where we talk about it and all the things you have to do with it. And I, please excuse my dogs, but it's that time in the morning. They just love to bark at the squirrels and I cannot get away from it. The, <laughs> even with this giant yard, I cannot get away from the dogs barking at the squirrels for hours at a time every day. The, uh, with so much going on in the world right now, suddenly there are many, many, many people who are looking at doing some research about moving abroad from specifically North America and Europe. And because this is happening, there are so many channels that are suddenly putting out, and there's always channels doing this, right? List of countries you may want to move to and this broad information about relocating to other places. And I want to give a little bit of perspective and information about people when you're evaluating those channels or you're using those channels as a tool, because uh, I talk to other people who have tra tra travel channels and we we talk about uh, these these lists and, and places that we've been and, and people who are making these recommendations and dig into quite often on our side, uh, what information these people actually have, what's what's real, what isn't. And um, I think there's some perspectives and, and context that is super important for you guys when you're evaluating channels like mine uh, that will help you with how to use the information that you find or which information is gonna be valuable for you. So let's talk about that right after the bump. So with a channel like mine, one of the things that I love to do is travel to other countries and bring you guys a lot of information about them. And it's fun to do list shows and put together like, here's places that I would recommend trying out or things that I think look interesting and just whatever. It's, it's really uh, popular. Those, those shows tend to get a lot of audience. I was watching a really great show yesterday that was talking about how terrible advertising is on YouTube. And it was really interesting because there's, there's two areas that are absolutely atrocious. One is the ads that they show to you. Often they are just complete scams and everyone can, you can instantly tell absolutely everything that they show as an ad on YouTube is a scam. Like it's absolutely crazy how terrible they are, whether it's health scams or um, there's so many that are like, the only thing you need to do in your life is poop more. And they'll have some crazy lady talking about how pooping changed her life as if you've never tried that before. And then there's the lady that is incredibly unattractive and she's standing putting in groceries into her car and some guy walks up and clearly sexually harasses her and is like you're like walking up the street and he's like you're the hottest thing I've ever seen and she turns around and he's like what's your secret no one needs to know what her secret is the secret is she's a homeless meth addict like she's obviously the poster child for meth addiction and yet this is an ad for some health supplement or something I have no idea these ads are insane there's a guy who just constantly, and I've reported it so many times as a scam, yet they keep running these ads to me of some guy who's selling like how your brain can unlock other dimensions and you can time travel using your brain and they sell a service for this. Like these things are nonstop what they're advertising on YouTube and it should be really obvious that it's all a scam, yet they make tons of money. And there was this interesting article on YouTube where they talked about how there's basically no space for legitimate advertisers on YouTube because the people that they would advertise with, people like me, are loose cannons and they can't, they don't want to take that risk. They don't want to uh, pay and, and have like a good advertising campaign, do everything right, and then have the show that they're on not be something they control or have any oversight over and suddenly do something that gets them in a lot of trouble or, or makes their audience upset. And so they want to advertise on tried and true mechanisms where they, you know, traditional television or Netflix or whatever, not that you advertise on Netflix, but you know what I mean, where they, they know what the content's gonna be and they know that there are auditors and censors and they can check it ahead of time and only advertise on material that they're okay with at a really large scale. Whereas with YouTubers, they'd have to check so many individual little things every day uh, and it would still be very risky, so they just don't. So only, crazy advertisers end up paying for ads on a lot of these spaces. Similarly, advertisers that pay influencers to put things on their show, and we are not paid to show anything here, right? So let's just be clear. We are a completely unpaid channel. We are only sponsored by you guys uh, through the buy me a coffee mechanism or that join button down there. That is it. We don't have, we don't even have merchandise. We're going to someday fix that. But uh, so, so for a lot of these channels, they're, they're advertising VPN services or some kind of subscription 
subscription software or uh, financial stuff. Like all of it's clearly a scam, terrible products, things you should never, if you see it in something like that, you really should be super wary uh, of why they're paying to push it through that mechanism. Why aren't they going through more traditional channels? It's not that it's absolutely impossible for something good to be on YouTube. and But when it is good, it's generally pretty straightforward, right? Like if we were to get a sponsor from like a car manufacturer or a beer company or something like that, it'd be really easy to say, okay, they're just trying to get the word out about their product. So cool, we understand. But when it's something like financial services, oh, we're going to give you financial advice. Just hand us $100,000 and we'll take care of you. Clearly, they're scamming you. These are fake banks or something's wrong. Stay away from all that stuff. Any any kind of like, oh, we're doing mental well-being, you know, sign up for this. No, it's all really bad scams. You got to be careful. So it's it's important to understand there's no downside to influencers taking this money. And this was an interesting thing that they talked about that uh, basically no matter how evil the company is that someone pushes and how much they tie their personal brand to it, they don't tend to lose audience. And so there's there's no ramifications from not taking the money. And most influencers are a flash in the pan. Sure, they may last a few years, but it's rare to go longer than that. And many don't make it that long whether they burn out or they just lose their audience uh, uh, organically over time. And so there's a huge incentive to get the money while they can and zero incentive not to. So what you end up with is loads of influencers who are in a cash grab because they found a momentary bit of success and they're trying to figure out how to maximize their money from it because quite often they can make quite a lot in a short period of time and they often know that they have no longevity or unlikely to ever be able to make that kind of money again. So they're willing to basically sell out all integrity because they have nothing to lose and their audience very, very rarely punishes them for doing so. So why not do it? So when you're watching other travel channels, so this is important that we want to explain a little bit of the mechanisms behind the scene for people who are making their money from their channels, which is a lot of people, right? When you get into the travel space and you're starting to get into, you know, relocation, Almost all of these channels are selling relocation services. Whew, oh my gosh, run away. Um, so many of them are uh, pushing you know, one thing or another to buy or they're being sponsored by someone. And some places are legit and you're like, okay, you know, oh, we're sponsored by Skillshare, we're sponsored by Artlist, something like that. Those are fine. They're still subscription services, but they're actual ones, right? So there's, there's good things out there. Um, <clears throat> Squarespace, like they're okay. Like, are they overpriced? Yeah, heck yeah, right? Do real businesses use these kinds of services? No, they're using much more professional things, but, you know, for people who aren't very business savvy and you're just watching a, a YouTube video, well, they're, they're a legitimate company, right? So you might as well use them uh, compared to anyone else. But uh, when you're... Um, when you're looking at these travel shows, right, this same incentive process is there. So there's very, very little incentive for someone to actually travel to places and actually create content that's meaningful. And it's almost impossible. So let's talk about that. So right now, everyone is making lists and I'm going to make one. This is what brought it up. It's because I've, I've lived in, in eight countries. I've been to 40. I'm constantly researching and traveling places and talking to people who go places. And I think I have some decent information, but even for me, the context is important. Any given person can only have spent so much time in any given country or region. There's only so much time in life and it costs so much money to do it. If you look at some of the heaviest travelers in the world, like the Kara and Nates, watch their show a little bit and you realize that while they've been to a lot of places, they've never actually spent any amount of time in any of them. They know nothing about the world and have less than a casual amount of knowledge, even after many years and being multimillionaires and being able to go anywhere they want and always traveling. They don't have a casual knowledge of the world that just a middle school student should have from geography and history classes, right? So, so getting information from them about what flight is nice or which lounge is nice to hang out in might be kind of interesting or useful, but getting information about where it's good to travel, what you might like, what where it's good to stay or whatever, they're not useful at all. They're just paid to show off different hotels and resorts around the world, and they just fly from one to another as quickly as they can, getting paid as much as they can. And kudos to them for coming up with a business model that makes them loads of money for doing something that they enjoy. That's great. But are they useful travelers for you to learn from? Absolutely not in any way whatsoever. They're complete idiots when it comes to travel and relocation. They know nothing. They know less than a person who's never researched, than, that's never done it, right? So, and their show is 
painful after any amount of time because once you realize how little they know and how little they're learning from their own experiences, that they are constantly day to day shocked by a world that supposedly they're seeing all the time. They have no idea what's out there. So that growth isn't there that you would expect in just a normal functional adult that is traveling around. But many, many shows are like this. And if they have this lack of resources, imagine how the rest of us are. Being able to spend your entire life traveling and relocating from place to place, you still can only accumulate a small amount of knowledge. The reality is, is that an individual show or presenter is at best able to come up with a small subset of information. So on my show, we specialize quite a bit on the information of Nicaragua, specifically when it comes to relocation and specific rules and uh, regulations and, and uh, processes. And we can give you really deep information because I'm involved with many people moving here and I moved here myself and I've been here for a long time and I've done a ton and we've researched it and we have multiple people and we've done it with families and friends and businesses and all kinds of stuff. So we have that information. And I try really hard to accumulate a lot of information across Latin America because one, I travel to a lot of those places. Two, I have lived in, in some of those places. Three, I know people in tons of those places. And four, I run businesses in many of those countries. So I've been involved across the region deeply in many ways for a long time. But you still need this context that I live in Nicaragua and here the information I have is, is one tier. Right. So my Nicaragua information is probably the most of anyone, honestly. And and for me, the number one thing I have is information on Nicaragua. Right. So the two coincide. And, and that is my specialty when it comes to more of Latin America uh, as a broad region where I can give you a lot of insight about travel and, and comparatives. I have about as much as most people who specialize in that. Right. So I fall into a category. So when you're doing a kind of a broad spectrum, no one has super deep information about any given area. You have to, you, you know, it's kind of a lighter bit of knowledge that you have about each place. So I can tell you about Argentina. I can tell you about Bolivia. I can tell you about Costa Rica, but I've never actually lived in any of those places. I've only spent time there and I do work there and, you know, I'm there on a regular basis. So there's, there's a certain amount of information I can give you. But if you really are interested in moving to, let's say Bolivia, then finding someone who does a show like mine, for Nicaragua, but for Bolivia would be ideal, right? Now, my show may guide you to Bolivia, but you would need a show or something similar that has deep information about Bolivia so that you can deep dive into that uh, and get that information. I could try to provide that. And in some cases, I can get better information than most people because of my access to things in Bolivia and having three offices there and having been there for a long time and having resources on the ground, right? But It'll never be the same as what I have in Nicaragua. It'll never be as good as someone who's actually from the place you're coming from who moved to Bolivia and is actively doing those things day to day and helping other people move there. They're just going to have deeper information about Bolivia. So that's an important thing. And that's kind of obvious. But in many ways, it's not. Because when you go and look at a lot of these travel shows, it's easy to find shows that are super popular. There's some famous ones, especially out of major tourist destinations, right? People out of Costa Rica, out of Ecuador, out of Mexico, they tend to get many, many, many times more uh, subscribers and viewers than people from lesser known locations. But the nature of being in those places means they're less likely to have useful information. They're more likely the people who just follow the crowd and are now desperately trying to pay their bills and so willing to put out whatever content pays those bills rather than the content that people need. It's not necessarily the case, but you can imagine how it goes, right? If you want to find someone who is a really expert traveler in the United States and they're talking about domestic travel, is it going to be the person who only talks about Disney World and has never been anywhere else? Or is it going to be a person who's found an out-of-the-way place, fallen in love with it, but has experienced places all over the country and is able to give you comparatives. Exactly. So people who are in those major destinations, Mexico, Costa Rica, and, and Ecuador especially, are almost guaranteed to not be good resources for much information beyond just the very specific place that they're in. And that's what we find, right? We find people who are there know absolutely nothing about even those locations in reality, and then put out tons of content and put out lists and all kinds of things. And often they've never even been to those places, or they have a very cursory knowledge of them. And that's fine. Someone has to put out those lists. And there's almost no one who's put in enough time in enough countries to really produce a list. So let's just propose a list because I'm going to do 10 countries uh, coming up in the next few days, 10 countries that I uh, recommend that Americans who are North Americans who are looking at potentially moving abroad should research as good options in different parts of the world that could make sense for you. Some of them I have visited, some I've lived in, and some I have not been to, some my wife has been to uh, without me. And, uh, 
you know, we're going to put together this list, and it's important to understand that I've done my research, and I know a lot about travel and relocation, and that this list is hopefully useful to you, but there's no possibility for me to have put in the kind of time living in each of these places that I have in Nicaragua. Physically impossible. I don't have enough lifetime to have done that. And if I did do that throughout my lifetime, the places I went to earliest would be so long ago, they wouldn't even be the same countries. If I did that and Nicaragua was the first one on my list, it wouldn't even be the same country it is now. And the same thing with like Cambodia, completely different place 40 years ago. So you have to have current information. And again, even people who are traveling heavily rarely have very very current information about very many places. A few for sure, but loads? No, it's just, it's impossible. And even the places that seem like they must have deep information, right? You're looking at like a nomad capitalist where they have a huge team in theory and just millions of viewers and put it, the reality is, is most of the places that would make the most sense for his audience, he has yet to visit and knows nothing about. And that's not to say that he's doing something wrong. It's physically impossible for him to be to enough places. No human can do that. The world is too big of a place. And so there's all these complications that come with trying to come up with this kind of information that no individual can actually compare enough places to do what you need in some of these cases. So unfortunately, the incentivization to put out low quality, low effort information with extremely little research is very high. It is a high reward and there is basically no penalty whatsoever for putting out bad information. And so when you are watching YouTube channels or anything like this and you're, you're trying to research places, be super critical. And that doesn't mean that these shows have no value and that you shouldn't enjoy them. And, you know, it's, it's important to uh, enjoy what you're watching, even if uh, the information is not super useful. Hopefully it's not inaccurate. Maybe it's just really fluff. And that's fine. But, you know, I fell in love with making travel shows because of Rick Steves, who went and spent an incredible amount of time in Europe every summer for 40 years or something crazy like that, and put out travel books, had his own tour guide companies, um, and, and made and wrote all of his material himself that were deeply researched. And he went on location and filmed every single one of them. And even Rick Steves had a very cursory knowledge of a lot of things because he didn't have enough time in life. Life just isn't long enough to come up with deep knowledge about all the different places that he was going to. And so that was an interesting eye opener that when I started living in Europe, one, because I lived there uh, much more of the year than he would visit, I was accumulating current knowledge on Europe much faster than he was. And I was living in places that he had never been. So there were really some of my most important parts of Europe, places that I recommend the most and are going to be on my list that are coming up, are places he had never been. And so it was really interesting to me that I was forging paths that he hadn't been on. And it felt like, how could this be? He's like the world's most seasoned European traveler, which is not actually true, but he is definitely the one who is most well known for it. And and he did a lot of work. Like he's truly an inspiration for a lot of people. And if he and people like Anthony Bourdain, right, put in tons of work, did a great job. But honestly, Anthony Bourdain often had an extremely uh, surface, barely scratching the surface. Look at most of the places he went. He didn't have enough time in life to spend real time in those places. So he would show up. He'd have a team that would guide him a little bit. He'd go try out some things. He would definitely get to do some interesting things. But did he really get to know the local places? No, of course not. Did he really know more about the countries than other people who are traveling there? No, absolutely not. Uh, but it feels that way because you have a big polished TV show. So when you're watching a lot of these YouTube shows, it is super important to watch their content and look for, you know, hopefully they're being honest. And I'm not, I'm not looking at people who are being dishonest, right? That's a different problem. It's more of people who are simply making a lot of content and presenting information as if they have much deeper knowledge than they actually do. And it's pretty easy when you watch shows, uh, if you put in a bit of time, just look at their history of their catalog of shows. Uh, look, they'll probably tell their life stories at some point. Do a little bit of digging in and say, you know, how much have these people actually lived uh, where they they say? How much have they put in, um, you know, different, like, I, I expose where I've been. And you can gauge my knowledge of different places based on that, right? You can say, okay, well, so Scott definitely lives in Nicaragua. So he has this bit of information there full time. He's been there for a long time. Here's the things he does. Okay, so, so. Yes, he might be bad, but we know that this is information that, that is current and this is where he is and he has this number of years. It gives you something to work with. And then you can say, okay, when he's comparing to Italy, 
Okay, so he lived in Italy, but not as much. And it was, you know, several years ago. So that, that gives you an important context to be like, okay, and now he's been, and he's been back to Italy since then. Okay, and so he's got a little bit of a refresher, but it's only a refresher. He didn't live there the second time. All right, cool, right? And, and, and it helps build a picture of what I'm able to tell you. Because if you're then, and, and some people will ask me, well, can you compare to Nicaragua and compare it to living in and just name a random place or compare it to Tanzania? Well, I can do a little bit of research on Tanzania, but not only have I not lived in Tanzania, I've not visited Tanzania. I would love to. I think it sounds fantastic. And I'm sure it's a really good comparison country for Nicaragua in a lot of ways. And I've spoken to people who have been in both countries relatively close to each other and are just shocked by how similar they are. Of course, they're at the same uh, latitude. They've got so, they're similar sizes, not in population, but in physical landmass. There's so much that they have that are, are decent comparisons that it makes a lot of sense to want to have a comparison of them. But I don't know any person who's actually put in enough time in both places to create a comparison that is meaningful rather than just kind of making things up. So this is a difficult thing that I don't think people who have not lived abroad and tried to make content like this are aware of, of just how impossible some of the things that we hope to get as information from people are to have. All right, no, so so I'm one of the best traveled people. Um, I hang out with Eric from Generic Expats, Eric Peterson, and like as examples, or or Ron from Near Shore Living, um, or or you know Grumpy Don Shader from from Grumpy Expat uh, in in Ecuador. Right, you, you take people like this, and all of us have loads of experience abroad, like tons and tons of experience, as much as nearly anybody. I mean, there's some people who have more, right? But but we're on that very high list of how much experience we have and how much we put in effort considering and thinking about the process of traveling and expatting and moving and living abroad. Even cumulative between us, there isn't enough lifetime and experience and possibility to put together a really good long list of comparing lots of different places. And of course, cumulatively isn't very useful because what one person thinks is great, what it will be a different experience for another person. And so when you're seeing comparisons and you're seeing lists and these kinds of things, be aware that in nearly all cases, almost entirely, these lists are just, we look some things up, we've been to a few places, we've visited, whatever. Some lists are a little bit better than others, but they are just for fun and they're not going to be super useful to you. To really dig in and make a comparison, you're gonna need to, and I talk about this a bit, hone in on regions and figure out which countries sound like they have the mix of things that matter for you. Of course, make your list before you do that, right? Figure out what matters to you and start putting that information together. And you're gonna need to accumulate people People like me and and list you know like I'm a resource for Nicaragua you got to find someone for Colombia you got to find someone for Argentina you got to find someone for Cambodia and you put those together and and use us individually to kind of gain a picture of what those individual places are like and you'll kind of have to make your own comparisons based on the information we're able to provide you for each individual place and of course I encourage you when you find places that are super interesting and really make a lot of sense for you you think that you actually go in person and check them out and put in some time and you know some footwork because no matter how much you watch my show you're never going to know everything you need to know about Nicaragua that that feel that sense I talk about this a lot once you step off the plane sometimes it just hits you as perfect and sometimes it hits you as nope not for me and there's no amount of me talking about this that can help you with that we know people from the show who've come here watch the show watch the show a ton participate a ton and the moment they're here something we would never have thought of like they're only willing to shop at one specific corner store and they absolutely demand that every person who is Western uh, must eat a specific type of bacon in a form that they, and they just could not handle that the store they wanted to sell that bacon and every expat wasn't eating that, ba like it was just not a thing that we eat them that much. And he, he was appalled and said that no, no real expat had ever been here because to him, this one specific bacon was the only thing that mattered. And nothing else about the country came up. And he could have gotten the bacon, but he had to be at this one specific store that wasn't where Nicaraguans buy meat products. And it just didn't make any sense. But that was so important to him. And who could have possibly predicted that anyone would have cared at all in that way? Especially when bacon is easily available everywhere. It's just it's so wild, right? But the things that matter to you may not be predictable. And things that matter to you may not be something you can predict. Right. To him, because there were Westerners here, he said, well, every Westerner eats bacon every meal. So there, it will be everywhere and every store I go to will have it. And that was just something he de determined in his mind as what Americans were. And so when he found Americans and they didn't eat bacon, he determined some some disaster had befallen them when 
in reality, I don't know any Westerners who are talking about bacon. Plus, they can always get it when they want. Like, I don't know. But these kinds of things, what matters to you is something that you may discover. And so you may come to a country and be like, wait, there's this thing that I do every day. And it never occurred to me that it was so important to me. Or it could be like that couple we did a video on recently who moved to France. And while they knew what French cuisine was like, it never occurred to them that the French actually eat that way every day. And she was appalled because to her, the whole world must eat like Americans every day. And she thought that living in France, people just did that for tourists or something. I don't know what they were thinking, but they were not prepared for what living away from their country was actually like. So these are important things to do firsthand because no amount of us explaining it is going to really drive it home. So my whole takeaway here is uh, taking a moment to really understand the context and, and empathizing with people who are making shows, not like mine necessarily, but especially ones who, who focus on making broad information that there's no possible way that they have any real information about. Nomad Capitalist is a great example. They give tons of information about different countries, most of which, when we've spot checked it, is completely inaccurate and just pulled from like ChatGPT, which of course doesn't source check and is wildly wrong, right? Eric uh, just asked me the other day to, to spot check a bit of information. He's like, like Chat GPT just told me that Nicaragua has a six hundred dollar uh, retirement number. Is that correct? I'm like, no, absolutely not. That was long, long, long ago. There's some misinformation websites out there that have been abandoned and just have old information. And Chat GPT doesn't know the difference between accurate, inaccurate, you know, real source, fake source, old, new. It doesn't know, All right? So it's just repeating whatever it sees. And and he knew that that seemed wrong. So he's like, this isn't right, right? But tons and tons of these lists and information are based off of that kind of just someone just looked at a website or someone just made something up and there's loads of misinformation and they have no way to know and no way to check and so so understanding what you're watching and, and, and my point was nomad capitalists with the deepest resources the most money the most viewers of anyone falls into the same boat it's just a guy spewing stuff that he's seeing somewhere without going around checking it and he can't so it's not saying he's doing something wrong if you want that kind of broad information about a lot of places there's no good resource on that, and there can't be. If I was to put together a company to do that, I would need to find people like me who are willing to move to, say, a hundred different reasonable countries. The cost of doing that would be mind-boggling. Even if you were willing to live pretty cheaply, part of what makes me able to do this show is, one, that I have a completely separate income and I'm willing to do this without making any money. I lose money doing this show. Uh, I am, you know... Uh, moved here with my family. I chose to do this. No one was paying me to move here, right? So it happens to be that I moved to a place that no one was making content, that I'm willing to make the cut. Like the, the number of things that come together to be able to make a show like this is very difficult. And no one's going to hire me to make this show somewhere else, right? No one's going to say, hey, Scott, we're going to pay you to leave the country that you want to be in and go to another one that you'll probably like, but it's not your first choice. And you're going to uproot your family and you're going to go through the entire process of, of everything and discovering how it works. And we're going to pay you to do all that while you make a show about it, right? Nobody is going to pay me to do that. There's no way to make enough money. The travel channel doesn't make that much money. That's why their shows also completely fluff, completely inaccurate. Nothing on the travel show is real on the travel channel is real. How could it be? It would be so expensive to accumulate that information. So this is like the big secret of travel and relocation is that other than isolated, very specific bits of, of resources, right? So Don Chater about Ecuador or me about Nicaragua or Eric Peterson about uh, the relocation kind of survey of Latin America. Like we all have our specialty and you can isolate that one thing or two things that we know really well and then you can get some things that we know a little bit and be like okay that's cool that's also useful but outside of that getting a deeper broader like wanting to have the kind of knowledge that i have about nicaragua across multiple countries nobody not lonely planet not nomad capitalist not the travel channel not conde nast traveler nobody has the resources or the incentive to put that together. It's not going to happen. And so understanding that that can't exist, that there's simply no way, is an important bit. And this is the same reason why the State Department's not know enough about traveling to a country. They don't have the resources to do this either. They could, but they're never going to throw that much money at trying to research something that isn't in their interest. It doesn't make any sense. So if you want to have these big surveys, you want to be able to put together this information, 
You got to understand the context of who you're listening to. You need to put together a lot of the comparatives yourself. You just have to do some of that footwork. There's nobody who's able to do it for you. And this is where, because of these kinds of things, it feels like hiring relocation consultants can be a really good choice. And it's exactly why it isn't, because there's no relocation consultant in the world who has enough experience to be broadly useful to you in the way that you would hope. You could get a relocation assistant for a very specific place, for a very specific process. But even like here in Nicaragua, you have to choose who you would work with based on exactly what you want to do. You want to live in an enclave. You want to live in real Nicaragua. You want to, right? There just aren't anybody, anybody with enough experience to be able to do it broadly. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. I'll put the link above. And of course, we have that join button if you want to become a member and just pay a small monthly fee to help keep the channel going. It a, takes a lot to put this show together every day, both in equipment and software and time. Really appreciate everyone who supports the show. I'll see you all tomorrow.